So our uh, nursery attendant called in sick today, so a special shout out to our families who are braving it out uh, in the church, and we appreciate you doing that. I wanted to share a text message I got driving into the parking lot literally this morning at 8 o'clock. This is from Rich and Don Heim. So this is the family whose apartment was on fire, and then you supported them. And they just sent this unsolicited. They said, um, pastor in church, I wanted to share an update on us. My insurance came through with a long-term hotel stay, and we've been living there. However, last night was our first night in our new home. We are very excited to get to this point. The kindness and generosity of you and your parish have truly touched our hearts and made this day possible for us. We are in the same neighborhood and still close to the church. We look forward to visiting with you all very soon and meeting the congregation. So it's just a reminder that something you did at the time you did it made a difference and made a significant difference. And if there's one way that the church can position itself, and it's not the only way, is to be a kind of rapid responder so that we can react nimbly and generously to people that we might find God entrusts to us. And so that couple, um, even though they're Episcopalians, we were able to help them in the church. No, we have a communion agreement, so it's fine, it's fine. So one of the preferred professions, if not the preferred profession in the Bible, is shepherding. And that's probably not a surprise to you for anyone that reads it, but really from the beginning of the text until the end, shepherds and shepherding receive a kind of primary vocation among the people that God chooses. So if you remember, even at the beginning, Cain and Abel, Cain's a farmer, and Abel's a shepherd. God accepts Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's, and we know how that ended, uh, but Abel was a shepherd. Abraham, a shepherd. Isaac was also a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. Eleven of his sons were shepherds except for Joseph, and that was probably some of the tension in the family. Uh, King David was a shepherd. And it's interesting that God chooses that vocation, among others, as a kind of highlight uh, of how to understand the relationship between God and the people. And Jews to this day will say, maybe one reason God chose that is shepherding is a job where you can maintain the relationship even if you're moving around, even if things are changing around you. If you're a farmer, someone takes the farm or you lose the farm, as we say, then you're not a farmer anymore or you don't have a place to farm. But a shepherd can take the sheep, move the sheep, and as long as the relationship is intact, uh, then that reality stays intact. And for Jewish people who have been in exile, essentially, since the destruction of the Second Temple, that's taken on a special meaning. And of course, for Christians today on Christ the King Sunday, that's our first text in Jeremiah about bad shepherds and about the need for a good shepherd. And that text from Jeremiah is interesting because as God comments, God doesn't go into a political treatise about the kind of archies that are ruling the people, uh, the defective monarchy, or the defective priestarchy, or the defective forms of government and leadership that are not allowing the people to flourish. God simply talks about shepherds. God says, you have been bad shepherds, and now my sheep are all over the place. I entrusted them to you. I expected you to love them. But everyone acts like a sort of hourly worker who goes, look, I'm just here to punch the clock. Uh, and whatever happens to the sheep, they're not my sheep. So what do I care what happens to the sheep? And so we hear this deep and abiding passion from God until God finally says, you know what? I'll just do it myself. And we even get it in there. I myself will come and gather all my lost sheep, all my scattered sheep, all my missing sheep, and there will be a good shepherd that grows out of the house of David, grows out of the stump of David, and that will be the one who is their righteousness and who will shepherd them. And so this is a good reminder for us on Christ the King Sunday that even as we make this proclamation that Christ is the ruler, Jesus is not a strong man among other strong men. So we don't say, well, how many aircraft carriers does the kingdom of God have? You know, how many units, how many, it's what uh, Joseph Stalin said about the Pope, how many soldiers does he have? And they go, well, he doesn't have any. Well, the Swiss Guard, 
But it's a, it's a categorical mit- a mistake to say that God rules in a human way. God rules as a shepherd, and as long as the relationship is intact, uh, then we can continue moving toward where God is going. And as Jeremiah shows us, when human beings are unable to be faithful, God ensures that the relationship stays intact by God's own faithfulness. And that ends up being our salvation. God's faithfulness to the relationship allows us to have a good shepherd and to be sheep, whether good or bad sheep, or lost sheep. Um, I think that's one reason why Psalm 23 is such a popular psalm at funerals, because it is a reminder that we have a shepherd who can shepherd us not only through life, but through death into life again. Now what happens, though, when this promised shepherd comes? And what happens when these sheep begin to be gathered? It's not like there's a celebration. If we fast forward from this promise of Jeremiah, we see this ruling king, and he rules from a cross. What a strange story on Christ the King Sunday to have Jesus crucified. We say, well, here's where it comes. Here's where it ends up. When the sheep and or the hired hands are only looking to their own interests, then we end up with a world filled with crosses. When the sheep and the hired hands refuse to acknowledge that they may belong to each other and that the fate of our neighbor may affect our fate as well and our spiritual well-being, we end up in a world of crucifixions or gas chambers, or guillotines, or whatever you want to say. This sense of not belonging to each other, this sense of seeing but not understanding, becomes a theme in this whole text. Because Jesus says that. The first phrase that Jesus says from the cross is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This is a remarkable phrase that Jesus says because when he says they do not know what they are doing, it's a special word in Greek. It's different than a kind of philosophical knowledge. And that's the kind of knowledge we normally think of, a kind of just cognitive comprehension and categorizing of information, what we all do in this information age of trying to filter out meaningful and meaningless information. Jesus' word of knowing is they see it, but they're seeing doesn't connect to a kind of comprehending. And so it's literally happening in front of their face. There's a sign on his cross that says, this is the king of the Jews. It's right in front of their face. But there's not a kind of comprehension. There's a seeing, but a not understanding. And so you have all these different little groups of people, and each one of them is attending to their own interests or their own stake in the story. None of them are interested in having the good shepherd who comes from the branch of David. So you have the crowd, and it said the crowd stood off to the side watching. So there's that first group of people who see but don't comprehend. Then we have a group of religious leaders, and notice the religious leaders and the soldiers both say to Jesus the same thing, save yourself. And we might say that that is the rallying cry of every self-interested person in the history of the world. Save yourself. Save yourselves. You know, it's sort of like uh, you have that in the movies when the water is coming through the ship. Everyone save yourself. It's over. Whatever we were doing together, it's every man for himself. Save yourself. And so the religious leaders say to Jesus, save yourself. And then we have the soldiers, and Roman soldiers drank a kind of wine that was sort of wine, herbs, and vinegar, maybe a mix of cheap wine, Uh, vinegar and Jägermeister, like a thing mixed together. Uh, And and it was very common that Roman soldiers drank this. And in fact, when uh, one of the, Pliny the Elder, when he wanted to show that he was a a man of the people, he would sit with a Roman soldier and drink this drink. Um, And that's what they offer Jesus. So the soldiers, in their mockery of him, offer him the soldier's drink. You know, the malt liquor, whatever they're going to give her. Here, Jesus, have a drink of this. Save yourself. But it's a kind of mockery, but that rallying cry is the same. The crowd that sees but does not understand, the priests that see but don't understand, the soldiers that see but don't understand, all say the same thing, save yourself. And the theme of this good shepherd, and the theme of this Christ the King, is that's the exact opposite mission that he has. 
He's not here to save himself. He's here to save us. He's here to save them, the mocking soldiers, the blind religious people, the frightened crowd who cannot speak and or understand. He's here to save all of them. And the only person he responds to is the person who connects with him in a kind of relationship, which is that second thief that says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Finally, we have the opening of the beginning of the kingdom of God, which is the restoration of lost sheep. Now, this, so, this criminal does not justify himself. He does not say, well, Jesus, I'm, I've just been a victim of a horrible misunderstanding, or Jesus, if you just knew what kind of childhood I had, you would understand how I got to this point. He doesn't go through any kind of explanation. He simply says, Jesus, take me as I am and remember me when you get to that good place. And Jesus says, I'll do it today. And that's a theme that we have in the Bible today. If today you hear his voice, don't harden your heart, we hear today. Today is the day. Especially after Easter, we hear about the eighth day in Christian theology, which is today. Today, Jesus, remember me. Today, Jesus, bring me to your kingdom. Today. So we say that for our sister Ginny. Today, Jesus, bring her into your paradise. And he says, okay. And we go, that's it? And he goes, well, what do you think I came for? This is the whole reason I'm here. I'm not here to play religious games with you. I'm not here to play power politics with you. I'm not here to engage in any of the games that you're trying to play with God. I am here with the mission to finally be the shepherd that God always wanted you to have, and I'm here. So I'm not here to save myself. I'm here to save you. And I'm here to bring you into this relationship that whether the temple gets destroyed, whether the people have to move to another country, whether there's hardship and dissension and fear about world events, we still have a good shepherd. And that shepherd loves his sheep. And by loving his sheep, we can proclaim that we belong to God and nothing can change that. No president, no dictator, no king, no anybody no force of arms, no economic embargo. Nothing can change what God has done for us in Christ. And by God's faithfulness to us, we are this community of found sheep who invite others into that gift. Amen.